بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي ليس لقضائه دافع ولا لعطائه مانع الذي حفظني في المهد طفلا صبيا ورزقتني من الغضاء لبنا مريا والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا عبد القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين الذين كلامهم نور وأمرهم رشد وسيتهم التقوى وفعلهم الخير وعادتهم الإحسان وسجيتهم الكرم لا سيما على مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري أرواحنا فداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام قال مولانا علي بن الحسين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه السلام عليك يا أمين الله في أرضه وحجته على عباده السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين أشهد أنك جاهدت في الله حق جهاده وعملت بكتابه واتبعت سنن نبيه حتى دعاك الله إلى جواره فقبذك إليه باختياره Our discussion continues on analyzing some of the kalimat, some of the verses, some of the lines of Ziyaratul Muqaddisa, Ziyarat Aminullah alayhi salatu wassalam. The ziyarah given to us by Sayyidul Sajideen, Imam Zainul Abideen, salamullahi alayhi. And as this ziyarah has not only points uh, to do with the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, but also it has issues to do with spirituality, it has a strong relationship with Laylatul Qadr, and is one of the most authentic and highly regarded of ziyarat, we decided to look at some of the different statements in the nights that we've had so far. And yesterday we ended with the discussion of the two lines where Imam Sajjad alayhi is ben, bearing witness to some of the qualities of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in this, uh, whilst he was on this earth, where he says, Allah I bear witness that you struggled in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as someone should struggle. And you gave struggling its haq, its right. وَعَمِلْتَ بِكِتَابِهِ And you acted on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَاتَّبَعْتَ سُنَّنَ نَبِيَّهِ And you followed the sunnah of the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Yesterday we spoke about acting on the Quran al Karim and the sunnah and the effects that they are uh, that are found when a person does so. And today we come to this statement then from this ziyarah where after bear witnessing to these three things, struggling and combating his nafs and self and struggling in the way of Allah, acting on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of the Prophet of Islam, then Imam Sajjad says, Hatta Allah ila Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you towards his proximity or what is said to be in Arabic, al-jiwar. Many discussions come here, the first of which is that the ulama discuss what is actually meant by this word jiwar, that the Holy Imam says, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called you to his jiwar, his proximity, i.e. until your soul was taken out of your body and until you passed away. But what exactly was meant by jiwar? And so here the ulama that ana analyzed and wrote commentaries on ziyarat aminullah said jiwar literally comes from the word jar. A jar, uh, of course, as is well known, means a neighbor in Arabic. So jar can mean neighbor. And jar, or, or the verb from which this is found, can also mean protection. And so either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was metaphorically saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you his own neighbor, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bought himself, bought you close to himself and towards his proximity, i.e. you moved above from this world of mad and physical realities to the world of the metaphysical and the akhirah. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying, until I took your soul and I brought you into uh, my protection, and uh, this, of course, was the second meaning, as we said, of uh, jar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what was he saying? Is that, what was Imam Sajjad saying? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took your soul and you were ascended towards the metaphysical life. Your soul was separated from your body. And here a number of questions arise, and we'll see towards the end of our lecture today as to what exactly uh, was meant by you were brought to the jar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the jawar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were classified as a neighbor 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were brought to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's proximity. What was meant by this? But before we can get to that discussion, we understand that Imam Sajjad, salamullahi alayhi, very importantly is highlighting something very, very vital in the life of any person who classifies him or herself as a believer. For the Imam says, Ya, ya, uh, ya Abu al Hassan, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you did all of these things in your life, you acted on Quran and Sunnah. However, what the Imam was highlighting is that some people they good they do perform good, they do good in this world, but only during the beginning part of their life. For example, there are certain people they're born in a religious family, they act on the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the first part of their life. Others, for example, in the middle of their life. What is the most important, however, is not being a mu'min now. It's not important, method that I'm a mu'min and I am someone who has iman today. Rather, what is important is that I die as a mu'min and as a believer. And so the Imam didn't just say, Ya Abu al Hassan, all throughout your life, the beginning, the middle, the end, all throughout your life, you acted on Quran and Sunnah, you struggled in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't just say this. He said, even in your last moment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took your soul from your body, even until that moment in time, you were acting on the Quran and the Sunnah and struggling in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. what the Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, was highlighting is what is important is that at the end of your life, so many people at the beginning of their lives, and you hear the, the example of Harbin Yazid, every single year in Muharram, at the beginning of their life, maybe they're not uh, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should be. A person all throughout his life should be subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But some people, unfortunately, at certain parts of their life are not. What is most important is at the end of his life, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking his or her soul, he remains subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here, therefore, what the Imam salamullah alayhi was highlighting were what is known in riwayat as al-adila in the mawt and aqibatul umur. What are these two things? And how can a person stay away from what is known as al-adila in the mawt? Aqibatul umur refers to the end of my affairs. Because we understand, as I've just explained, the end of my affairs is the most important. For how many people do you know when they were young, they were religious, when they were married, they were religious, when they first got married, when they had children, they were religious. But after a few years, they became the most irreligious of people. And how many people do you know that weren't religious in their lifetime? A lot of their life, they weren't religious. But suddenly something changes their life and now they become the most pious of believers. Aqibatul umur is at the end of my affairs, I still have iman uh, in my heart. I still have belief and faith and taqwa as part of my life. And that's why when we look at this idea of aqibatul umur, and I shall explain what is meant by al-adila in del mawt, we see uh, a very interesting uh, anecdote is uh, narrated from one of the khutaba, one of the big lecturers of Iran. He says that on one occasion I had uh, traveled to Mashhad al-Muqaddas the city of Mamrida, sallallahu alayhi wa And in the city of Mashhad, I had gone there during the time of Nowruz. So the Persian New Year was coming close. Many people, they of, uh, every single year, they go to the holy city of Mashhad for ziyara of Imam Rada, So the most busiest place in Iran at that time is the shrine of Imam Rada, He said, I had gone to the holy city of Mashhad. It was the night of Nowruz. Many people were in the, the shrine of the holy imam, and it was packed to the brim. And what I was doing is I had done my ziyarah, I had done my ibadat and worship, and I was walking to different, different parts to the, of the courtyards of the shrine to see who is there to uh, see the mu'mineen method, and I was walking around. I went to one courtyard and I saw that there's one of the big ulama and maraji who is praying there doing his ibadat and worship. I went to another one. I saw there is a second marja. He's come for ziyara of Imam Rada alayhi salam. I went to a third. I saw a third one, a fourth, a fourth one. So I thought, how rare is it to see four big maraji, ulama, all in a shrine of the holy imam at one time? All of them in the shrine of Imam Rada alayhi salam at the same time. 
And of course, people were doing dua, people were asking for supplications. And often the question that comes in people's minds is what should I ask? If I want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from something, if I'm in the shrine of Imam Rida, if, if I've gone to Karbala, and I want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the intercession of this holy Imam, what should I ask for? And so the Sheikh said, I went to one of the marajah. They knew me, of course. He was a well-known uh, lecturer, as I said. He goes to one of the alama. He says, if you could ask for one thing, for yourself, not for anyone else, not dua for Sahib Zaman that we do, not dua for your parents, not dua for uh, other people that you know, your family, your friends, your teachers. No. Dua for yourself. What dua would that be? And so he would reply by saying, I would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma, Allahumma j'al awaqiba umurina khayra. Oh Allah, allow the last moments of my life for me to have taqwa and iman and leave my life and leave this world with taqwa and iman so that the end of my affairs is a good end. He says, I went to another one of the maraja. I asked him the same question. He gave me the same answer. He said, if I could ask for one thing, is that the end of my affairs in this life is a good one. Right now, I'm a marja of taqlid. Who knows what happens to me? How many examples in history can you find of people that are one moment in time with the biggest uh, of mu'mineen in that city, in that place? And a few days later, shaitan deceives them. They become the worst people that they die the death of kufr. مثلا. He says, this is my, my dua. He went to a third, he went to a fourth. He said, coincidentally, every single one of them has had asked for the same thing. Allahumma j'al awaqib umurina khayra. Oh Allah, allow the end of my affairs to be one where I have iman in this heart of mine. The end of my affairs to be a good one. And therefore we understand that what Imam Sajjad salam was highlighting was that Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salamullah alayhi amirul mu'mineen, even till the last moment of his life, struggled in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, acted on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. And therefore, as I said, one of the discussions that comes whilst analyzing this line is al-adila in the mood. Al-adila comes from the word adala, which means to turn away. And we realize that Adila in Dilmut is a concept that is spoken about in Riwayat where it refers to a person who all his life may have been a mu'min. Or for most of his life he's been a believer, he's been a muwahid, he's been someone that uh, recites the Tawheed, recites his prayers. But in the last moment of his life, Shaytan comes towards him, Shaytan deceives him and asks him, Madalan, to uh, worship another Lord or to do sajda to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person changes from his iman into a state of disbelief in the last moments of his life. Because as we know, when a person the last moment when my soul is coming out of my body, often I don't know what's going on. A lot of people are unable to speak. That sakratul mawt is when shaitan comes trying to distract the human being, take him away from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what happens is many cases have taken place where a person in his last moments, his soul is about to leave his body, he denies the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. he dies without aqibatul umur khayra, without having a good end to his affairs, rather they die a death of disbelief. And this is therefore what Imam Sajjad salam was referring to, that it's not just important to have done good in one part of your life or another. What is the most important is to, at the end of your life, be someone who is multabis bil iman, mutalabis bil iman, someone who has iman in his heart and uh, is protected from al-adil and al oh. If that has been understood as to what the Imam is referring to, then we come to the ways within which Ahlul Bayt والسلام, and the Riwayat have told us that I can uh, be protected from this Adila. And as we know, one of the supplications that we have is known as Dua'ul Adila, which is recited for the same reason. Person wants to protect his nafs and soul from turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his last moments. Rather, he wants to be like Ali ibn Abi Tal. That until his last moments, he had ita'a and worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are the ways? Number one, as I said, that dua and supplication is there. And we are told, A person should try and continuously recite dua al-adila 
whenever they can to strengthen the heart from uh, turning away in their last moments. This was number one. In addition to this, however, ulama through riwayat of Ahlul Bayt السلام, gave us different ways within which a person can protect their soul from this adil. And of them is Fakhrul Muhaqqiqeen, Rahmatullah. Fakhrul Muhaqqiqeen, in actual fact, was the son of Allah Mahalli. And his title was Fakhrul Muhaqqiqeen because of the uh, great level of intellect and ilm and knowledge that he had been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we're told that Allah Mahalli, Rahmatullah Ali, becomes a mujtahid at a very young age. Before he becomes even Baligh, however, Fakhr al muhaqqiqin his son became a mujtahid even before him, even earlier than him in age. For example, let's say Allah Mahalli becomes mujtahid at the age of 12 or 13, Madhalan, Fakhr al muhaqqiqin became a uh, mujtahid at the age of 10. Fakhr al muhaqqiqin gives a very uh, interesting piece of advice to protect yourself from al adila in Dil Maut. He says that, and as we discussed in the first night, uh, we often give a person an aman. I give someone something to, to take care and give it back to me, for example, after a few days. Give it back to me after a few months. Give it back to me after a few years. And the sign of a mu'min, as I said, is that they do ada'u al-aman. Inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanat ila ahliha. He says what you can do is that right now in your life, in the middle of your life, wherever part of your life you are in, we don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take our nafs or soul. But right now, if a person has true aqidah, believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Messenger of God and the Ahlul Bayt and their isma, how many people are there at one point in time? They have the love of Ahlul Bayt and say the shuhada, salamullah alayhim, in their hearts. And a few years later, they begin to deny uh, the wilaya and ita'a of Ahlul Bayt. Is there any bigger tragedy than this a person at one point in time in his life was a mu'min? And then he goes to deny the wilaya and the excellency and the infallibility of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam. Fakhrul Muhaqqiqeen says the true aqeedah, the correct aqeedah that you have right now in your hearts, think about it, even say it out loud and place it as an amana with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the way that I can place amana uh, to people physically, I can give someone my phone, my money, keep this, give it back to me later. He says, likewise, I can give amanat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't going to do khiyana, isn't going to trick you and not give your amana back. He says, right now, say, Ya Allah, I place the belief that I have in you and the Holy Prophet of Islam and the Emma and the, the Day of Judgment and the questioning of the Qabr and all of these things that I have. Ya Allah, I place all of these beliefs that I find in my heart as a wadi'a, as an amana, something I entrust you with, Ya Allah, give it back to me in the last moments of my life, just as I am leaving this world. He says, this is one way a person can protect himself from al-adila in del mawt. I gave it to, as an amana to Allah. I have that belief now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it back to me in the last moments of my life. This was one way. In addition to this riwayat, very interestingly spoke about... Um, that which protects a person's faith until the last moments of their life. For example, Rewayat speak about the idea of a person who prays his salah fi awalil, fi awali waqtiha. As we understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the believer a certain amount of time that this is the time that you have to pray. Of course, it's best that you pray at this time, but if you delay it slightly, you still have a few hours, methalan, or hour and a half, whatever it may be, to pray your salah. However, the riwayat allude to this fact that if a person wishes to be protected from adila in del maut, that that belief that he has now and practices that he have now go all down the drain in the last moments of his life, in order to be protected from that, one of the ways is to constantly read his prayers fi awwali awqatiha whenever possible. And in this regard, we see a number of riwayat and a number of ahadith speaking about the effects of someone who prays his salah fi awwal al at the time that the salah is coming a lot of people they have a habit they're ready they're sitting at home the time has come but still shaitan comes to them or whatever they decide to do something which is of no importance at the time of salah in regards to this you know often people uh, remember uh, 
uh, one million things that they have to do at the time of Salah. Before Salah, I've got nothing to do. I'm free. As soon as Salah comes, I need to do this. I need to do that. This was one of the tricks of Shaytan. You get remember you remember things that you supposedly are very important for you to do at the time of Salah. So the Riwayah says Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sees that a lot of His servants are delaying their prayers. Some of them delay. Some of them read it. For example, Qada. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks his angels. He says, لِمَاذَا أَخْخَرَ abdi salatah." Why did my servant delay his prayers? What was the reason that he didn't pray on the time that I had given to him, even though he was free, madalan, even though Allah, I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the, the health and strength to do so? Why? So the angels replied because he had a hajah. He had something he wished to do. He had a need to fulfill. Something in his life, he had to pay this, he had to buy this, he had to get this, whatever it may have been. Because he had a haja, ya Allah, this person delayed his salah. Do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied? He said, if only that abd of mine realized that all of his hajat are in my hands. You delay your salah and go somewhere else because it's very important for me to do this and I need to fulfill this and I need that and I need that. Allah says, all your needs are in my hands. Come and pray to me. I'll give you everything that you want. Rather, the human being leaves meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and goes towards fulfilling other things of the dunya. Yes, sometimes a person is ma'dhur. A person has an excuse. He's unwell. He's traveling. He's stuck. He can't make time for prayer immediately. He has to delay it slightly. That's a different story. But when a person is able to pray salah fi awwal awqatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sees him do ta'khir and delay, he's astounded by this the level of ma'rifah of this servant of his. And that's why Imam As-Sadiq would say in a riwayah that we compare two prayers. Often you ask, what's the difference if I pray at this time at 12 o'clock or if I pray at, for example, 2.30? Well, what's the difference? Imam As-Sadiq he compares both of these prayers. That prayer which you performed fi awwal al waqt and that prayer that you delayed and you didn't give importance to. He said the example of a prayer that is play, prayed fi awwali waqtiha compared to one that is delayed is like the example of akhira and dunya. Meaning what? I mean, if I have these two prayers, one was performed fi awwali waqt, the other one was delayed. The example of the relationship between these two is like the akhira and the dunya. Why? What the Imam was saying was very profound. Akhirah, whatever is found in the Akhirah remains. The bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me in the Akhirah don't vanish, don't, uh, aren't uh, taken away from me. They remain. Akhirah has happiness without uh, any grief, has health without sickness, has youth without old age, has nur without dhulmah. What comes in Akhirah remains. What comes in dunya goes very quickly. The Imam was saying in the same way that what is in Akhira remains and what in dunya goes very quickly, this is like the Salah of that person. If his Salah is at awwalul waqt, the athar and the effects of that remain on his soul. And if it's like a person, if, if it's uh, prayed at the end of its time, it's like the dunya, whatever comes in the dunya doesn't stay, it goes very quickly. The thawab and the reward and the effects of that Salah won't stay with that person. How much more expensive how much uh, more be uh, bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are found in the Akhirah compared to the dunya? How much more reward and athar and effect does your salah have fi awwal al waqt compared to Akhirihi? And that's why we're told if a person wishes to protect themselves from this adila and al maut, they perform salat fi awwal al qatiha. Arawaya mentions in this reg uh, regard. As Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa alayha, one day comes to the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And she says a person doesn't give importance to salah, doesn't give importance to prayer. When a person delays their salah, even though they're able to uh, pray it fi awwal al waqt, another uh, way of saying this is that they don't give importance to prayer. Everything is ready, I don't want to pray. Or people that say, my heart, I don't feel like praying right now. When a person says, I don't feel like speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's because their heart has been stained with the noob. How can a believer says, I don't wish to uh, speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I don't wish to converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
When I delay my prayers, another meaning of this is that I don't give importance to Salah. Zahra salamullah alayha comes to the Prophet of Islam. She asks him, what are the effects on someone that doesn't give importance to prayer and delays them? The Prophet of Islam says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give that person 15 uh, or rather that person, ha that, uh, him delaying his prayer has 15 effects from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 15 things happen to that person when they don't give importance to their salah, when they delay, when they rush their prayers, mathala. Some of these were in the dunya, some of these are whilst he dies, and some of them are in the akhirah. Now, I don't want to mention that whole hadith. The hadith is uh, lengthy, and it will take uh, us uh, time to go through all of those 15 things and it will take us away from the center of our discussion. However, just those six things that happen to a person when they don't give importance to salah and they delay method. This is the first thing, Ya Zahra, is that person doesn't have any barakah in his life. I.e. either they'll have a short life or no, their life may be lifespan, may be normal but they're not able to do the same as what someone else did in a shorter amount of time. Al-Barakah fil-Umr, their lifespan, they won't have barakah and blessing within it. How many of the ulama and marajit do you see today who have very long lives? One person is doing exercise and is on this diet and is on that diet and is trying to do as much as he can to stay healthy. But unfortunately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his life uh, very early. And then you have certain marajit, for example, they have no time to do any of these things. They have no time to have a diet plan like you have a diet plan. They have no time to exercise like you exercise. Yet still, they're given a long life. Why? Because they pray salafi awal awqatiha. They perform their prayers at the beginning of the time. So the first thing that happens is you don't have barakah in your lifespan. Either meaning your life becomes short. Or meaning that there's no barakah and blessing in the time that you have. Sometimes you see people, everyone has 24 hours in a day. It's not like I have 36 and you have 24. Or I have 24 and you have uh, 100 hours in your day. Everyone's day is the same. Some people, they're able to do and achieve much more than others. Certain ulama, you leave, uh, read about their life. A lot of them died young, but they're able to write books upon books and teach this many students and do this much research. Ulama today, for example, alongside teaching and studying and uh, researching and writing, and normally you think that how much more can you do? You read this many hours a day, many of the marajit, even in their last moments of their life, 10 hours, 12 hours of read, reading and researching, even in the last stages of their life. Sometimes you think, okay, you study and you teach and you research and you write and you have to eat and sleep and uh, do all of these things and still extra in addition to that they do ibadat they worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all night so how does the person have this barakah in his his time and his lifespan the first thing that prophet of islam says a person who doesn't give importance to his salah no barakah in his lifespan the second thing rizq People are always looking for what dua can I do for rizq? What supplication can I do? How many times should I recite it? Should I recite it like this? Should I be in wudu? Should I face tibla? This surah, that surah? Read your salah at the awal time and give it its importance. Allah will flood your house with the rizq and sustenance that you deserve. This was the second. The third, certain people on their face, you see that they have nur. We don't talk about beauty, we speak about spiritual nur and light that you see on the face of certain individuals. The Rawai says if a person doesn't give importance to their salah, they may be beautiful, but you see no nur on their faces. Some people you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has illuminated their foreheads and their face with the light of piety and taqwa. Others, nothing is there. Why? al ala salah fi awwal the fourth thing that the Rewire says is that if they don't give importance to their salah, their other amal also won't have any benefit to them. And how many times do I do a certain amal? I have a certain dua. I'm trying to do a certain thing. The Rewire says if I don't give importance to my salah, that other amal, either it won't reach uh, its success or won't give you any benefit. 
And how many times does a person have an intention? I wish to recite, for example, Ziyarat al Shura 40 days in a row, or I wish to do Salatul Layl 40 days in a row. But they're unable to complete it. They don't get the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete it, to finish it. They get stuck, for example, on the 15th day. Why? One of the reasons they didn't pray their salah, they didn't give importance to this. The fifth, you can see how many major effects it has on a person's life in this dunya. The fifth is that that person's dua and supplication won't reach the sama. When that person supplicates and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, I gave you a gift. That gift is the best way you can speak to me. Instead of uh, using that gift that I have given you, what do you do? You don't give uh, importance to it. Then you raise your hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, salah, that dua of yours won't reach the sama and go up. And the sixth thing is that when people do dua for believers, we have certain supplications for mu'mineen wal mu'minat, مثلا. He says, when a person does dua for a believer, your name won't be part of those people. Ay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you're not part of the mu'mineen if you didn't give importance to your prayers. And so when people pray for the mu'mineen and the mu'mineen are part of those prayers and supplications, you won't be part of it. These were six things in this world, for someone who doesn't give importance to his salah, one of those also that happens during the, the death of a person is al-adila and al mut If this has been understood, then we realize what Imam Sajjad alayhi salatu was salam was saying in this ziyarah. Ashhadu anna ka jahadta fi Allah haqqa jahada wa amilta bi kitabih wa attaba'ta sunan nabiyya yabna Abi Talib, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, all of these things that you did, you did till the last moment of your life. That, that moment, even when you were struck on your head, you were indulged in salah and the mustahab prayers in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until your last moments. As I said, the ziyarah says, Hatta da'ak Allah ila jiwarih. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to his jiwar. And I said that this jiwar either refers to the word jiran. Some have explained it to mean the neighbor. The neighbor that you have, of course, not the physical neighbor in this case. But metaphorically being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or either it is understood to mean in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hellfire. And the ulama, when they discuss this part of the ziyarah, hatta da'aka Allah ila jawar, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to his jawar, they mention a riwayah which explains exactly what this, uh, this is referring to. The riwayah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mala'ika on the day of qiyamah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call out, where are those who are jiran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in qiyamah? In the afterlife, where are those people who are the Neighbors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A group of people, they stand up and they say, we are those who are the jiran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the neighbors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. we are close. We have been given close proximity to Allah azza wa jal. When they say we are those that have been given these, this status, the malaika ask them, what did you do? Now of all of these people, now of all of these mu'minin, you were given that status. Understand that people hear about Islam and community and how a Muslim should live. This riwayah explains it, shows the beauty of the religion of Islam, shows how a person lives in a community with other people. People often want to discuss you know, issues of community. This is one of the very important riwayat. The angel said, What did you do that made you? People who are part of Jiran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'd say something very simple. They'd say we would love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we would help each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. we live in a community. One person would love another. One neighbor would love, love another person. One believer would love another person for the sake of pleasing Allah azza wa jal. And we would help each other in our daily lives to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of this. Allah made us jiran Allah. Those people that are in close proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for helping one mu'min. 
has such a status and reward in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Imam says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just take your soul. He made you part of jawar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made you part of those who are of close proximity. For you, Ya Abul Hassan, would love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would help others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times have you heard when it comes to the uh, nights of the istishhad of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam and his martyrdom. How many times have you heard the story of the orphans who were waiting for that man who would come in the middle of the night time? And then they realized that that man who would help us every single night and come in the darkness of the night covering his face so that he can remain uh, mukhlis and sincere in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They realized that that man was in fact Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Those that help each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with regards to this, we find not only examples in the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And you've heard many of these examples. In the life of Amir al Helping others for the sake of Allah. Loving other believers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But even in the lives of the other Emma, they showed the importance of this practice. For example, on one occasion, Imam al-Kadim sallallahu alayhi is performing tawaf and circumambulation of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We already know we don't need to go into the details of how much reward it is for a person to do tawaf of the house of God. And we're told that once a person, for example, has finished his umrah or once a person has finished the tawaf of hajj, recommended act is to do tawaf, which is mustahab, and for example, the ulama say that when a person is there and is doing his mustahab prayers, he should, for example, gift each tawaf to uh, one of the members of Ahlul Bayt. And in fact, the ulama say when a person does these mustahab tawaf, if they give or gift one tawaf each to one of the members of the uh, family of the Prophet of Islam, they should give more. So, for example, I gave one for each imam, they should give more as a gift to Az-Zahra sallallahu wa sallam This is one of the things that is recommended. Ala kullahu, mustahab tawaf, we know of the great status it has in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam is doing tawaf. A person comes, he stops him, he says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, there is a mu'min that requires something from you. And he thought that I'll tell him now, once he finishes, for example, his seven tawaf, which are mustahab, or once he finishes even this tawaf, he was in the middle of tawaf. Once he finishes this tawaf, then he will uh, come and help that person. As soon as that person says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, there is a mu'min who wishes some help from you, he breaks his uh, tawaf and goes. So they stop, they said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, we didn't mean that you have to come now. We would never order you, we would never command you. We were requesting you that once you have finished what you're doing, come and uh, help this person. The Imam said there is much more reward and helping another mu'min than performing circumambulation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's house. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person helps for the sake of Allah, loves for the sake of Allah, makes him part of jiran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, we find a person comes and approaches Imam Hussain sallallahu wa sallamu The person, he walks through Masjid al-Nabawi. Medina is very small at that time. He walks through Masjid Nabawi to the other end where he sees Imam Hussein is standing. He says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I need help with a certain issue, whatever it may have been. So Imam Hussein says, No problem, let's go from where you came. And so, in the way that this person had walk, uh, walked through the Masjid Nabawi to get to Imam Hussein, again, they walk back through the same way. When they walk back through the same way, Imam Hussain alayhi salam sees that Imam Hassan, his older brother, sallallahu alayhi, is busy doing itikaf and worship in the house of God. So Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and it wasn't the third day of itikaf, the beginning of itikaf. Imam Hussain alayhi salam asked this person that when you walked by here to get to me and ask me to help you, did you not see my brother Imam Hassan alayhi salam? He says, no, I saw him. He says, why then did you ask me if you saw him first? Why didn't you ask my brother to help you? What was the reason that you came to me? He said, because I saw him busy with ibadah and worship and i'tikaf. I saw him busy in i'tikaf and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I didn't want to disturb him with helping something, help with him helping me with something that I had. 
Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, you have misunderstood. For helping another mu'min mithlek like yourself has the reward of 70 itikaf in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is exactly why Imam Sajjad says, Hatta da'aka Allah ila jawari. Ya, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, until every moment of your life was spent combating your nerves, struggling in the way of Allah, acting on the Quran, acting on the Sunnah, but even until your last moments. Even your last moments were spent implementing the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until because of the love you had for the believers and the help you gave to the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to his jawar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these holy nights to allow us to benefit from the ziyarah of Amir al muminin and the shifa'ah of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam to increase the love of Amir al muminin alayhi salam in the in the hearts of everyone to allow us to benefit from the nights of Shah Ramadan and Quran al kareem and to grant shifa to all of those who are suffering, especially with the uh, coronavirus that has been uh, spreading over across this earth. And most importantly, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the help of Sahib Zaman and allow us to become as close as possible in character, in faith, to and spiritually to Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina nabiyina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.